Okay. All right. Um, thanks very much, everybody, for joining us tonight. Um, sorry we couldn't do it in person. Um, we will at some point have a CLF event uh, in person, and we can't wait for that. So uh, for today, at least we've got a really, really great presentation from Kelly um, and can't wait to get that started. Uh, I just wanted to give a bit of an overview of the Carbon Leadership Forum for anybody that's not familiar with the Carbon Leadership Forum. It's a group that was originally out of the University of Washington, and it focused largely on accelerating the transformation of the building sector to radically reduce the embodied carbon in building materials and construction through collective action. So the CLF pioneers research, it creates resources, fosters cross collaboration, and it incubates member led initiatives to bring down embodied carbon emissions of buildings down to zero. And the network is made up of architects, engineers, contractors, material suppliers, building owners, policymakers, all a bunch of people who care about the future and are taking bold steps to decarbonize the built environment with a really keen focus on eliminating embodied carbon from buildings and infrastructure. Currently, the network brings together over 5,000 professionals from over 2,500 companies in over 75 countries in over 1,000 cities around the world. And you can join the CLF for free. You can join the online community that allows you to connect with your peers and exchange information. So CLF Toronto uh, is a, a local hub. It's a collection of CLF members who connect and share resources related to the GTA region. And we organize events that empower industry professionals to radically reduce embodied carbon from buildings and infrastructure. So we are one of over 30 local hubs across the world. And there's three other local hubs uh, within Canada right now. So there's Vancouver, Ottawa, and Calgary as well. Uh, CLF Toronto is growing rapidly. Since launching, we are at 54 members and we would encourage all of you to be a part of the network. So a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, feel free to type your questions um, into the comments box or the Q&A box. There will be time at the end of the presentation for questions where you'll be able to unmute yourself and ask questions as well. We just ask that during the presentation, you keep your video off and keep yourself muted until the question period. Um, Kelly, unless you've got any, any alternatives to that, but otherwise I think we'll go with that for standard. Um, and so, as I mentioned today, we've got a really great presentation. Uh, we're really privileged to have Kelly be with us today. Kelly is an associate director with White Architecture, an adjunct professor at the Daniels School of Architecture at the University of Toronto, and lead climate strategist at the Bartlett's Landscape Architecture Department, just to name a few of many things that Kelly is uh, working on. Uh, Kelly has been leading the half studio at U of T with a focus on having the, having the embodied carbon uh, in G GTHA's built environment in this decade, and that's what he's going to be speaking with us about tonight. So this research studio has focused on multi-residential buildings in the GTHA, the results of which have been really widely shared, and they are really key to a benchmark study that's taking place with the City of Toronto for Part 3 buildings. And this year, the studio has been focused on mass timber projects. So I'm really looking forward to hearing what Kelly has to share. And Kelly, please take it away. Right on. Thank you, Emily. Um, and thank you for the invitation to be uh, with the CLF. Um, really, really exciting for CLF kind of speaking event here. So uh, I will just go ahead and start this. I've got, um, I think I've got about 40 minutes probably of content to talk through and then hopefully lead us plenty of time to have some Q&A and some discussions. I, I, it is a pity that we're not doing this in person. I was very much looking forward to meeting people uh, in Toronto tonight, but here we are. So, um, yeah, I'll, I'll kind of get right into it. And and uh, this this idea, this towards half studio, very simple premise built on the United the United Nations IPCC mandate to say, uh, never mind net zero by 2050. We need to half the 2018 emissions this decade by 2030 the less than eight years what we have here. And so I wanted to focus that conversation in the context of Canada and, and the GTA coming to the University of Toronto to teach. And, and I think the first thing, you know, probably preaching to the choir with this group, but you know, that half of what the the real, the focus here on, on embodied carbon, this the blind spot, certainly in my education a decade ago, and, and understanding that the rate of construction, I've been in Toronto for the last month here, uh, visiting over the holidays, I'm just, just jaw, like my jaw is dropping with how much construction is happening right now in the city uh, specifically. So you think about the compounding problem that we're doing, we're introducing more and more embodied carbon and also 
kicking that up into the operational pie. So it's a really wicked problem and one I'm hoping to figure out how to teach, you know, a, a generation of architects to, to address and, and speaking to you all to, to catalyze a conversation around this in the city. And, you know, I started off coming back, having done quite a bit of this kind of analysis in Rwanda with my previous job. And I first wanted to look at a, pro a project of my own. This is my cottage up in Halliburton um, that I designed and uh, for my own family and, 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 you know, did all the right things, uh, what I thought was sustainable designing it eight, nine years ago. It's a hot, it's off grid. It's uh, completely based on solar PV. It's takes, you know, all the basic passive principles into the, into account, but I had not really thought about embodied carbon. So doing this kind of, uh, analysis coming back to it after those years, you know, really was, was eye opening. So this kind of, you know, sectional study of the building, you know, revealed that by by cubic meters, it's not a wood building. It's, it's anything but. You know that this is made out of a whole bunch of different things. The standard Canadian construction here, uh, that this cottage is 92 tons of of uh, you know equivalent. This is roughly like my whole lifetime driving a car in Canada, wrapped up in this one project. Um, that only 10% of the emissions of this building are associated to the wood framing that you just assume this, you know, wood clad, wood framed, wood for a uh, wood interior project, uh, only 10% of it, that 65% of it was, was uh, encased in the crawl space foundation of this cottage, a space we only ever go down to, to occasionally get like a box of wine, um, totally unoccupied and totally unnecessary. And furthermore, you know, that more than half of my cottage is from, from petrochemicals. And, and really, in hindsight, you know, thinking, you know, I, I, I carry a certain amount of, you know, schadenfreude with me, thinking about this project now, but why, why did I specify that amount uh, in this project? And, and, you know, it had been, it's been featured in, in Dwell, it's been, you know, here, you know, characterized as being highly sustainable, and that it's tightly insulated structure draws on energy, dot, 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 right? So, you know, I have been doing exactly what I was trained to do. I was doing exactly what, you know, frankly, my professional body has been telling me to do, what, what architecture ought to be, doing exactly what our own government is telling us uh, how to build our housing, which is to say, you know, the current CMHC guidelines here of the 77 things in a Canadian house, 11 of them are made out of oil, right? And I think at this point, it's really, you know, I've stopped to really reconsider, I think, my education and the assumptions that, I have as one as a Canadian and, and, and two as a Canadian architect and, and someone in the built environment where I think it's, it's time for us to really reflect and be honest with ourselves about the nature of how we build in this country um, and, and to understand why we've arrived at, at it. This certainly has not always been the case, but this is where we are and this is where we need to improve upon. Now, um, got to the, the honor of coming back to the University of Toronto to, to begin to have, Ask this question: How do we improve? You know, inspired by a lot of the action happening out of the West. You know, where you know, obviously, as Emily said, where the Carbon Leadership Forum was born, and and looking at what the city of Vancouver was doing. You know, like and like anybody in Toronto, well, if they could do it in Vancouver, surely we can do it here too. So I wanted to use the use the studio as a venue to kind of catalyze a conversation around this and, and incentivize Toronto to to look at this as well. So building on the methodology that, that Vancouver did, which you know, they went out and solicited a study of 40 odd uh, multi-unit residential projects to develop a benchmark to say, you know, if you wanna improve, the first thing you need to know is what you're proving upon. So to do that in Toronto, I had the a good fortune of having friends and, and allies at, at firms around the city basically said, can you give us a, a building, uh, a range of, this is a year ago, you know, wanted something as kind of uh, indicative of contemporary construction in the city. So either completed in the last five years or in the ground. And so was was fortunate to get a big range of, of projects here that range in, in size and typology and, and construction systems. Um, the students uh, kind of intentionally told the practitioners, just give us your drawings. We don't want the BIM models. I want the students to be able to put this thing all together and to really understand, you know, for many of the graduate students, it's the first time they're really looking at things like, you know, details and specs. So uh, here's a kind of snapshot of one of the students explaining for this year, the Moriyama Tashima project, putting, putting this puzzle together to create the model to really understand what it is that's in a building and, and kind of un un reveals the complexity. And here, uh, the methodology that one of the students explains, you know, how they go about doing it. So they get the kind of soft copy, 
they go through the drawing set by set. In this case, it's a Swedish project, you know, understanding, okay, what file relates to what drawing, then putting those together in, in the basics of a 3D model, uh, taking the block instances, in some cases, doing some translation to, to really understand, you know, what, what does this detail, uh, what is it, where is it? Um, and then combining all of that into these sectional models, much, much like my own cottage, you know, we only have four months for this research semester. I can't really expect them to do a complete building soup to nuts. So what, what we do is a structural bay that's a stand-in for the whole project. So you can see here on the left that, that sectional model. And then from that, we do a, a kind of very exhaustive bill of quantities. Um, and then take that and, and tally it up into a spreadsheet. And, and we've been using one-click LCA to do the analysis of it. Now, you know, I think uh, important to say that, you know, this includes the structure, the envelope, interior finishes. It does not have everything in it. So these are incomplete numbers and, and much like a lot of what we've seen in LCA. So we're not, you know, we do not have the, the MEP systems for in it, uh, in it for instance, and, and the landscape and site works. Now, um, I'll give you a kind of look over of year one and then uh, in year two. So as mentioned, the first year, what were these MERBs, the multi-unit residential buildings? Um, and, and the summary here, I think, you know, uh, initially shared this just over, just about a year ago, which if you look at this, I think that the, the key takeaways for me are, um, you know, that if we want to reduce our carbon footprint on a square meter basis, we should just be doing uh, low rise building. We know how to do stick frame, um, you know, fairly high density, low rise that that would kind of satisfy that that demand for just having the embodied carbon. When you compare it to say the mid rise and the and the, and the high rise projects, which are predominantly cast in place concrete frame. Now, there's some nuance here though too. I think that's a, it's important that within that mid rise set, you're, there's actually quite a bit of fluctuation. You can see that Oban Flats project comes in about 400. Uh, uh, kilogram equivalent per square meter, whereas the high project, the SQ1, 615. And there's some, there's some reasons why. And I'm going to kind of dive into some of the drivers from a year ago. So the, you know, the number one driver, and I, I, I know there's, some, there's a member of the audience that might cringe when I say this, but the single biggest driver of embodied carbon in Toronto's multi-unit residential is reinforced concrete, gas in place reinforced concrete. There's no getting around it. Uh, Toronto uses a lot of cement and steel. Uh, we invented fly form concrete, um, and we are pouring a hell of a lot of it. And that's that's just how we're building our buildings right now. Think of that: the lowest carbon med rise project that uh, that we'll, we'll, you'll see more of employed a steel and hollow core structural system. So it was a kind of hybrid where um, you know they they look to reduce the weight of where concrete was employed. It was hollow core precast and and uh, and steel um, steel structure. So which re you know resulted in a kind of dramatic reduction uh, relative to its cohort. So re recommendation here to any policymaker would be incentivize lower carbon structural systems. Look at your cement mix and figure out how to use less concrete. Um, here is a kind of overview of all the projects and the. Uh, the kind of like as a pie chart, the radius is, is representative of the total emissions. And then you can see that, that concrete and then uh, as a segue here, aluminum or aluminum is the is the second biggest driver. And, and if you're familiar with, you know, Canadian contemporary construction, specifically in Toronto envelopes, and this is where architects have, you know, all this is where our agency really lives, where the structural engineers are really driving the structure is that XPS insulation and aluminum extrusion based glazing systems carry the highest embodied global warming potential of the of the materials in the study. So what we think we know about XPS, it's encouraging clearly to see that the market is making a better XPS. It's still still not great. It's it's a you know, it's less bad um, where I think that you, know, you think about the just the absolute proliferation and predominance of uh, unitized uh, curtain wall or window wall, certainly in the Toronto um, mid to high rise market, that the sourcing and smelting of all this window wall is incredibly emissive. It's aluminum is of all the metals is the highest emissive, though it could be recycled, just that it's we're at a point now we're still extracting it and that stuff's coming from all over the world to ultimately make our window system. So here, you know, incentivize and develop lower carbon envelope systems. Um, and here's an overview of some of the envelopes that we saw in Toronto, where we're trying to look at embodied carbon next to, you know, the R value. And 
On the left is a fictional project where the student uh, swapped out the XPS of the one immediately beside us. So these are kind of brick veneer um, pro of the, of the uh, I think it's a metal stud of one of the smaller projects there. So you can see, you know, our value of 27, but just by going from XPS to wood fiberboard, you could you could cut the footprint of the that that uh, section half. And then on the right, you've got two sections of window wall where, you know, I would I would ask, you know, is the R value and the uh, embodied carbon associated with floor to ceiling glazing? Is that is that a fair um, is that the right thing to do? I'll, I'll leave that one there. Uh, here's a kind of look at that, just, you know, same R value, two materials, one you can buy on the shelf at Home Depot, one you can't right now. But one on the right, we used to make in Canada, not that long ago. Um, the third driver, and this is where I think things got kind of more interesting, certainly architecturally and for planning. And, and uh, if you've read, my friends at SVN just put out a, a call to the mayor to review the, the implications of planning on emissions. And this is a big part of it here. So, on-site parking and subglade floria, which is you know parking spaces and basements, which is typically where we're putting our parking lots, is underground in Toronto. Now, uh, these are disproportionately uh, kind of unintended consequence of minimum parking requirements, and they result in big, big basements because it's uh, it's floor area that falls outside of uh, your your floor you know your floor area ratio counts. Your gross floor area does not include floor area below grade, and that for me is a big, big problem with Canadian planning. So, um, you know, here are the projects that we'll look at, you know, some of them have up to 50% of a project's emissions uh, re related to the below grade parking structure. So, you know, of the of the lower, uh, lower rise projects, so you can see here, it's kind of a stick frame above uh, concrete uh, foundations. You can see here, even where the foundation is only half below, two thirds of the project entire emissions are in the foundations or in that basement space. Um, the mid-rise here, you can see quite a bit of difference here. The River City project, interestingly enough, you know, that part of town, they couldn't go underground for from groundwater and flooding uh, reasons. So that just resulted in, in a, a parking that's above grade and, and thus has a, a much improved footprint. Um, and one student, this is the uh, project in the junction, the Duke condo here, said, well, I know how to reduce 50%, just get rid of the parking. And, and she's dead right. There's, there's no reason at all to have that underground parking structure. Um, the, the kind of knock-on effect of all this underground parking is the dimensional impact on the structural grid, that the spacing requirements of a, of a say, Canadian parking space don't match your average you know, span of a living room or a kitchen. So... Uh, what we get as a result are really big transfer uh, beams and, and transfer structures throughout our projects. And so, you know, recommendation here is review the minimum uh, space parking requirements or think about how to line them up. And to illustrate that, uh, this project, um, uh, I think this is SQ1, the overlay here of the red of the, of the residential floor plan against the black of the parking structure, you can see that slippage happening in plan and how it's actually reconciled in section is that dark black poche there, that one meter thick transfer slab, that's the entire ground floor of the building to, to, to mediate you know, only two floors of underground parking here. So it's, it's, it's an astronomical amount of concrete just to fit in some, some, some cars below, below this project, 14% of the total project. And then the fifth one, which is really into the weeds of, of planning is the, is the impact of the angular plane, the step back requirements that I think are so ubiquitous in North American planning. And they have a real unintended consequence because all those step backs result in a more uh, complicated structure and, and more and more transfer beams and, and, and more material. And, and I didn't have a great uh, um, drawing to do this, but I took this photo at, in the drive through getting coffee at McDonald's yesterday to, to show one of these step backs here, which you can see here is a part of a building that's facing south. It's, it's on the south side of St. Clair Avenue in Toronto. So there's no real reason to have a step back there from, a, from an angular plane or from a daylight perspective, no argument. And I would, I would say that there's a bunch of floor area there that we've left on the table for no good reason, um, other than some, I would, I would, some outdated uh, thoughts about planning and urban form here. So from a purely carbon perspective, this is irresponsible. Now, uh, to, to show a few examples of this, uh, the Bacte Zorba Core Modern um, is a great kind of stand-in to show some of the, how the students have approached this. So here, 
It's a seven unit uh, uh, project. So they took the one unit as a stand in. Um, what's really interesting, these smaller projects just have way more stuff in it, you know, much like that CMHC document, you can see the smaller projects, just more stuff, uh, as opposed to the, the, the taller projects that have far, are far less complicated in many ways. And so here on the left, uh, what the students done is, is the three dimensional uh, representation of the project in the middle, uh, kind of the volumetric uh, of that material, in this case, concrete, and on the right, the emissions associated with that material. So, you know, going through the assemblies, you can see the different families of woods, uh, drywall, something I think we use again, we use so much of, we don't really think too much about the impact of, of all that, uh, uh, the manufacturing of, of drywall. And the brick, um, this project's kind of, you know, has a kind of really distinguishing brick, this gray brick. And, and in interviewing uh, the architects, you know, asked about you know, why, why gray? Why not, you know, the Brampton brick, which you could get more, more locally. They're like, well, they don't have a, we really wanted a kind of shades of gray and, and the Brampton folks only operate in kind of like the orange and brown hues. So uh, we sourced them from Arkansas and from Nebraska to, to get these hues. And, and, and as a result, you know, you, the travel distance for that brick increases quite a bit, but from an embodied carbon perspective, it's not that big a driver. It doesn't result in that big of a difference. Um, in fact, the bigger difference is the fact that, you know, Nebraska and Arkansas's uh, power, the grid that they sit on is far, far dirtier than the one here in Ontario. Um, and I think it's important here when you're when you're thinking from an embodied carbon perspective to really think about the material provenance, like what is the process of which the thing is being made? So in the case of that brick, you know, where's it being fired? What's it being fired with? Is it being fired with gas? Is, do they have an electrical kiln? Um, make some phone calls. And even within Canada, and I'll, I'll show a project later on that really shows this, is like the difference of, say, a sawmill on Ontario and a sawmill in Alberta is hugely significant because, you know, this was the power grid today. Ontario is typically around 70 grams per kilowatt hour. Alberta is up around 450. It doesn't take you much to really think like, wow, like for every kilowatt hour in, in Ontario, that's roughly 1 11th the emission of, of one in Alberta. And that's why I think it's really important that even our national policies have to acknowledge the grid intensity that our buildings sit on. The argument for going to a very energy efficient building in Alberta from a retrofit perspective, I would say is 11 times more than to do it in Ontario, as far as where we should be putting our money right now. Now, um, the student was also looking kind of at the installation, my, 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 my good friends here, XPS, that little squat box in the middle with the off the roof um, on the right there, the stuff we've been insulating our homes with now for decades. But beyond that, he's really interested in spray foam. Uh, you know, I think, again, another material we tend to put in our, our building sections without giving probably too much, uh, you know, not, not a second thought. And, and it's kind of just like, what, what is spray foam? Like, what is the stuff we're actually just kind of filling in a hatch and dropping our spec in there? Um, and, and, you know, lo and behold, it's a two-part agent. It's a foaming agent and it's a blowing agent. And... Uh, if you've been in the world of embodied carbon, that, that term blowing agent, something Anthony Pack has probably taught you where, you know, HFCs, HFOs, C -C -H -H HCFCs, all the things that ripped hole holes in the ozone in the 80s, uh, while well, they're still very much, you know, part of our building industry here. So um, the student was kind of, you know, asked to shop around, like, let's see what kind of you know, results you can get for spray foam. And what was what was kind of interesting is and, and unforeseen is that the North American spray foam was somehow like, you know, only one quarter that of the European spray foam, very counterintuitive from an embodied carbon perspective, if you think about, you know, North American versus European product. And of course, you know, he he had the curiosity and the gumption to go and really dig into this. So here the manufacturer um, you know, basically claimed that that these blowing agents actually sequestered carbon upon uh, their removal and uh, disposal, which is, I think, a pretty dubious claim to make. So he went and read the paper by Chelson and Jensen that it cited, and in fact, you know, 50% of this residual content of released between nine to 300 years. So that's a pretty massive uh, window of time for a manufacturer to be saying, that it actually is acting as a, as a carbon sink. And, and, uh, and, and if anything, just to tell you to read your EPDs with a fine tooth comb uh, when you've got the time. Um, and I think just to leave it on this, it's also 
you know, never mind what the EPD says, I think just this image of this is what you need to wear to go to work if you're applying this stuff um, probably tells us all we need to know about the nature of the material itself and, and whether or not we really should be using it. Um, another project is the Alexander Park townhouses. This is looking at, at basements specifically. Uh, in interviewing uh, the architects at, at uh, LGA, you know, the one thing about this project, if you're familiar with this part of the city, there was an existing uh, uh, housing uh, development that had been built in the 60s, and the city as a TCHC, TCHC project were going to redevelop, increase the density, and the existing residents were engaged in the process to get to move into a new house on site. Now, you know, of that, uh, normally they said that they would not have basements. Their original houses did not have basements. They were just slab on grade, but that the residents insisted on it, that they were critical to occupation and that they would be used as extra living space. So this is back to, this is gross floor area that did not count in zoning and, and the residents have demanded a basement. And, and it's kind of, I've, I've been back in Canada for the last month. I live in London. I don't have a basement there. No one in my whole neighborhood has a basement. And I spent, I probably spent about 25 to 30% of my time back in Canada in a basement. Um, uh, and, and this is what it looks like is we build these spaces because they're cheap and they're legal. All right. Um, and we fit them out, but you actually look at the image on the left and, and what that basement is, is made out of. I mean, it's, it's just a bunch of concrete. So I'd ask the student last year, okay, let's have the same amount of floor area, but let's like just slab on grade as opposed to, you know, um, the kind of su sunken situation. And here was the difference, just going slab on grade, never mind, you know, the FAR. <laughs> we cut the project, you know, cut the concrete out by by roughly a third. Now, <clears throat> to get really radical, I said, okay, well, let's let's do the basement. But let's do it like our grandparents would have, you know, every building that I knew of, but say before 1920, let's build that out of stone, uh, what would result and, and this is kind of the most shocking thing from last year. So on the right is their, your foundation of stone and on the left is a foundation of concrete and you just need to think about why we're building the way we're building right now because 100 years ago every house in Toronto was built with the bar on the right. Um, the last one, uh, super cool. Uh, in the Oban Flats project. And here you can see from the section that there's really deep foundations here. It's kind of these deep caissons because of the, the specifics of the site, really difficult soils, a lot of the, like much of the city, a lot of subsurface water issues or, or soils that had been part of the lake previously. So real part of intense, uh, some peer, peer structure for this, but Regardless of this, when you compare it against its cohort from a from a just percentage of the of the concrete making it up, it's it's a it's a fraction, and that's because it's that hollow core, and also it's got a reduced basement. And I've done this in two two ways. Um, the first is that they challenged parking. This is before the minimum parking requirements. Now there's a discussion to get rid of them, which is very encouraging. Uh, but this was just they they managed to reduce the parking requirements by half of what the city required, and then. The, that the developer insisted on a core, uh, uh, a steel steel frame and hollow core project. And when we first interviewed them, they said, such difficult design, we'd never do it again. Then we came back and showed uh, them the numbers, like, this is great, we're gonna do this all the time, um, which, is, which is encouraging. And I think this is what this form of evaluation can kind of reveal. So here, the, the parking requirements, only half um, per, per unit. And thus you can see the square meter associated with parking is just like collapse. And they did this by going to a cassette system that kind of stack parking you'd think you'd see in New York or Tokyo. Uh, and by doing this in this project, it really, it really made for an efficient uh, foundation system overall. You can see just one floor of, of, uh, of foundations. And then from a hollow core perspective, you can imagine, you know, hollow core, you're reducing the total volume of, of concrete, and I'm not against concrete, we need it, we just need to use it more efficiently. And, and I think this is our looking back at technologies like Holocore that were more widespread could really be a way forward. Um, last project of the last year's study here is 41 University, which you've driven up and down, you'll see is starting to take shape. They're, they're the demolition of, of, the, of the, whole, the former building here, you can see um, this a transformation of this historic building with the addition of a hotel and residential above it. Um, 
Now, the, the students, when looking at through the drawings, first, this drawing in the middle, they thought it was a mistake, but it's, again, it's a transfer slab. It's happening at the 13th floor, and it's the 3.8 meter thick concrete transfer slab to, to mediate, again, between a residential grid and, in this case, a commercial parking grid below it. So, you know, mixed use, uh, it certainly has a lot of benefits to the city, et cetera, but, it, you know, the, when you're going from different grid structures, this uh, this results and our, you know, how we're designing and engineering currently. And that one move resulted in 5% of the project's total concrete for a, for a large project like this. This is this enormous. Um, and, you know, the students were kind of like, well, how do I quantify this? And it could build, you know, it build the, the equivalent, uh, the foundations for 92 of those townhouses we'd seen. Now, uh, <clears throat> this, this research was published about a year ago. You can see here last April in Canadian Architect. Um, the feedback has been really encouraged, presented it to uh, the city of Toronto, uh, Lisa King and the Green Standards team. And that has subsequently led to, um, you know, getting paired up with our friends at Mantle Developments and, uh, and, and the city. And we got a, we successfully wrote a grant now to, to expand this initial benchmarking study and include all part three buildings with the aim of, of doing, creating benchmarks for the city for future development here. So, um, encouraged and, and hopefully this is the direction of travel because ultimately I think if we have clear benchmarks it's really going to push innovation across you know our entire uh, industry. Um, now as a kind of follow-up to last year I, I figured this year to change the pace I wanted to look at mass timber. I wanted to say okay if you're kind of standard Toronto concrete frame you know cast in place fly form is 500 um, uh, per square meter what would the mass timber equivalent be. So uh, to do that, again, enlisted a series of projects that are either recently complete or, um, or in the ground. And, and there's not a lot of mass timber in Toronto. There's like, you know, the, uh, the, there's a four projects here that are, that are happening in Toronto. One is complete, a few more in construction. Uh, to, and I also want to expand the, the, the set to be beyond just Toronto and to look at, say, mass timber more globally and how different is it across similar climates. So fortunate to have two projects in the UK where I'm based, um, one from Wathistleton, one from Hawkins Brown, two projects in Sweden with uh, the firm I work with, White Architecture, project, uh, two projects out west, uh, Michael Green Architects Project, for the Catalyst Building in Spokane and the Adidas headquarters by Lever. And then the ones in Toronto here, the TRCA headquarters, AD Atlantic, um, the Ontario Secondary School Teachers Federation from uh, Moriyama Tsushima and the Tallwood uh, Tower at the University of Toronto here with Pat Cohn MGMA. Um, I haven't, this is the first time I'm presenting this. The students just, we just had our final review before Christmas. So this is a kind of first, uh, first attempt at showing this work. And part of the semester, I wanted to get students actually into the forest to really understand, you know, where is this wood coming from? So here, this is in Simcoe County, and the sustainable forestry practices happening there. So really fortunate to have Forestry Forest Ontario come in and, and give us a lecture and support the studio. And, and here are the, you know, here are the kind of first results of, of, of the work. And I think, you know, to call attention to a few things, um, I've broken out the A series uh, summary here. Um, it's I uh, wanted to really isolate, say, that upfront carbon versus say transportation and, and construction emission, but to draw your attention to say that 416 number, that average full building. So last year for the, you know, the average project in looking at the mid rise and the high rise project was 497. And these projects are at 416. Um, so that's the first comparison. And then I think beyond that, uh, I've paid some attention to that biogenic number. So, you know, this is the, the, the sequestration associated with every project per square meter. And then on the far right here, I've got the kind of net. So if you, and, and I, this, I hope we have a lot of discussion about this. How do you account for sequestration, all right? Now, to summarize this, I kind of trying to follow a similar, you know, the points I made last year. Now, um, uh, you know, the first driver, um, mass timber buildings offer only minor reductions in body carbon over typical construction. I think, you know, 416 versus 497, these are some of the most not innovative projects that are happening right now. Um, that's a 20% reduction. It's minor, I would say. But however, they offer a significant reduction if you take biogenic sequestration into account. So, um, you know, 
with this on average, with the sequestration, you're looking at about uh, a 209 uh, per meter squared or roughly 40% of typical construction. So I think there's certainly some promise here. Um, and, and this is encouraging. So my recommendation here is establishing policies and codes that promote and, and encourage the use of biogenic materials. This is not just, it's not just about, you know, CLT and glue lamb. It's about materials we can grow that are renewable that can also still carbon. This is about like, you know, hemp, wood fiber, um, you name it. We grow it, we can put it in a building. I think this is what we really uh, need to be thinking about in a space for innovation, I think, within Canada. You know, to illustrate this, there's two projects here, the Adidas headquarters on the left and the Catalyst building on the right. And, and the green in the structure is representative of, of, of uh, mass timber. And so you can see, you know, two projects that have the same embodied carbon per square meter just happen to be there, both 357. But, but really different of volumes of wood overall. So that Catalyst project, if you look at it net as a far, uh, far lower embodied uh, um, you know, footprint with that in account. The second driver, carbon sequestering envelope systems. So you know, in stark contrast to the highly emissive aluminum dependent unitized glazing systems of last year's study set, the envelopes of this year's study reveal substantial upfront and operational emissions reductions achieved by A, a reduction in window to wall ratios and B, the incorporation of mass timber into the facades themselves. These savings are further amplified by whole life carbon assessment given the comparatively short lifespan of unitized systems. So, you know, recommendation here, takeaway from today, let's, you know, incentivize the deployment of lower carbon envelopes. And, you know, speaking to the architects, this is, this is all on us with our building science, um, you know, partners and to institute minimum service lives for building envelopes. I think we need to really be looking at the warranty and life cycle of the windows and, and cladding we're specifying. Um, we cannot burden the owners of our buildings with materials that have to be replaced in 15 years, I'd argue. Now, here is uh, an overview of, of the envelopes of the study. And you can see there's like pretty big array. Um, and I could, could walk through a few of these and probably talk about this for, for a long time. But, you know, some of the things to point out, like the Sarah Cultural Center, this is a, this is a double, kind of a double skin system for that, for that project. And this is in a very far north of Sweden. It's got a high embodied carbon associated with all the glazing and the mullions. But you can see even, even within the mullion assembly, they've got wood in it. So it has, it's got some sequestration in there. The TRCA headquarters here in Toronto, um, I mean, just knocking out of the park in, in, in many ways. It's got mass timber as the backing for the wall. Uh, and then the wall system itself is like, you know, mineral wool and the cladding is a, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a low carbon tile. So you can see here and looking at, we have not yet really brought in the, the R values are, are on some of them. So you can see the R value is quite low, up around 30 is where you want to be in Toronto. Um, these kind of like, I think this is how we need to be thinking about our walls. What is the, what is the trade-off over time um, of our assemblies? The third driver was regional sourcing of the results, uh, significant reductions depending on where the wood was coming from. So the provenance of the mass had a, has a sizable proportionate impact on its global warming potential, i.e., you know, wood's low on its own. And if you're shipping around the world, well, it's going to, that's going to increase it in some cases, you know, 10 to 15 percent uh, increase when you're sourcing transcontinentally or internationally. And, and for the four Toronto projects, notably, only one of them had any wood sourced from the province of Ontario. The majority of the CLT and glue lime elements have been imported from European sources. So I think that that's an indication of where Ontario's current mass timber industry is. And, and certainly, um, you know, we should be sourcing and specifying more. And so Here's a look at some of the projects that were in that Western Canadian group. So this is that academic tower in Toronto that sources its wood, you know, all the way from Northern Alberta, uh, that Katera project uh, in Spokane, Washington, a lot of that's wood coming up from BC and Alberta. And then the Adidas headquarters being quite local, its sourcing was entirely with Oregon. Um, you know, there's a lot of players in the space and, and the, you think about how, how the whole forestry sector um, is currently configured and, and how I think it's an important part of, of, of our understanding where we're getting things from. And here's some of the impacts. So you can see of just the wood that that tall wood tower, you know, sourcing wood from Northern Alberta all the way to Toronto, it's, you know, compared to 
um, compared to that of the of the lever building on the right, you know, it's it's a significant difference that travel distance to haul all this wood across the country. A fourth driver consideration is a whole life carbon view. So, you know, marrying reductions afforded by mass timbers, you know, biogenic capacity with high performing facades because it results in, you know, really good buildings uh, over a whole life carbon perspective. So, um, you know, here, you know, probably my favorite uh, result of this year's study was a, was a look of the TRCA building. And I'll spend some time to talk this through. If there's some chat, I'm sorry, I can't see the chat. I just see there's nine comments. I'll come to you in a minute. But um, that we, what, what the student was asked to do, and I'll get more into it, was, is basically compare, say, your Toronto typical office building with the TRCA. And then the TRCA had a lot of, I'd say, bells and whistles, uh, you know, working with incredible uh, climate engineers at Trend Solar, you know, solar chimneys, preheated external glazing. And, and the question I asked as soon as like, okay, well, at, at the additional expense of all of these passive systems, how does it play out over time? And so, you know, taking into account, I say, you can see here that the, the green line here is the base embodied carbon versus your standard, you know, a much, much reduced embodied carbon over what the assumption was for a, a kind of standard office block of its own, but then compounded over time. When you think about how much this is the kind of marrying embodied carbon with energy efficiency. So over, you know, over a 30 year time frame, the TRCA building would be 60% less than your standard Toronto office, which is again, I think encouraging a way, I think the time, the time-based way we need to be looking at our buildings. Finally, to be specific and not generic, and this is probably the most um, say uh, um, nerdy of all the things for, for this specific group. I hope everybody can appreciate that industry-wide uh, generic EPDs are, can be significantly different from manufacturer specific EPDs for the same product. So shopping around for EPDs early can help us ensure that we're, you know, eventually sourcing specifically timber and sustainable, low impact, um, and, and importantly, available sources. And, you know, specifically through the Catalyst projects, what I'll show you, the delta between the generic data and that of the supplier was about a 40% increase in the project's embodied carbon. So, you know, here, the, the generic for a glue laminated timber, you can see it uh, at 100 cubes is only 17 tons where depending on you know the the actual supplier here western arc crib or structural m great differences you know up to 20 like 15 percent more uh in one case uh you know two to 15 percent more depending on again where the manufacturer and that has a lot again to do with the grid back to that uh, understanding the electrical grid now i'll whisk through some of the projects from this year um we had Andrew Waugh as part of the group. And if, you, if you're familiar with Waugh Thistleton's work, I mean, they're the most probably been really progressing CLT and mass timber in the UK now for, for some time. Uh, and this project is in Shoreditch, uh, it's in central London and uh, a remarkable project in many ways. It's got CLT cores, it's got uh, LVL uh, beams instead of glue lamb. And the student here was like, you know, Andrew Waugh mentioned that you know, LVL compared to glue limb is a much, much more efficient use of a tree. It uses up to 90% of a tree's mass, which is 70%. And it, it bore out when she compared the EPDs of, of various, say, suppliers in Europe that the net impact of LVL, because it was such an efficient use of, of the material, um, was significant. You can see here, like almost twice that of, a, of the Swedish glue limb. She was, I've asked my students to like, not just take the project as it is and, and come back and offer suggestions how the project could be improved from an emissions perspective here, looking at, you know, taking, replacing the basement floor with an additional floor and, and doing it out of wood. What would that result in? Here, looking at, at trade-offs of if the building had some fiber cement borne brick, if they, you know, change that out for, for alternatives and then ultimately presenting this back to the architect. Like if you, you know, if you'd done, a few changes here, you could really drive your emissions down from what is already a phenomenal building even further down, uh, you can see um, by, by 73. Sarah Cultural Center by White, um, up in the very north of Sweden. This is just opened uh, just before the holidays. Uh, this is the most, like, this is the most 100 mile diet building I'm familiar of. This, the mill and the forests uh, that built the building are literally within 60 kilometers of the site. Um, and had a big impact. So here you can compare, say, the academic wood tower to the Sarah Cultural Tower. 
as a percentage of its over global warming potential. Like sourcing local has, has real implications when it comes to wood. Um, and at these two are the two tall buildings of the data set. So it's interested just comparing the tower components themselves, given the nature, the specific nature of the uh, U of T build. So the students here were uh, worked together to compare, you know, where emissions are, um, how, how they match up to sequestration to each other, um, you know, how much wood is in each of them, the Sarah's as a hotel versus an academic building. So typologically, some differences. Um, and even in the envelope, like with a difference, say, say Toronto climate and that in like the far north of Sweden here, a dual glaze system on the right versus the kind of single on, on the left here and, and, uh, and the results. Uh, TRCA headquarter in Toronto by Buckholtz McAvoy and, and ZAS, uh, a remarkable project in, in many ways, as just mentioned here. So a look of the interior, it's got these atriums and skylights, um, it's kind of broken up and it's got these solar chimneys, as I mentioned. Um, it's sourcing, it comes, comes from all over the world, like did not come from anywhere in Ontario, from, from a wood perspective, from Austria, from Sweden. Um, and the student here, you know, after looking at the wood, there's quite a bit of metal in this project, relatively speaking. A lot of it was structural steel, and that structural steel mostly associated with the solar chimney. And so I asked, you know, okay, what is the trade-off? What's, you know, what is the payback on all that steel? Um, and moreover, it has these preheated glass panels, as I mentioned. So, you know, really high-tech system, obviously additional embodied carbon. What is the time value of those decisions? And then how does that match up? You know, this project is below the TRCA is tier four um, uh, for, for office buildings here. It's incredibly high performing. You can see here it does 56 kilowatt hours a meter versus the, the, the tier four uh, for the green standards versus what you'd expect for a typical office building. Um, remarkable. And then that is, again, the graph that I showed you earlier. So this, you know, making decisions up front and over the long term and those compounded really driving uh, a significant reductions from business as usual. Uh, finally, the Catalyst Building uh, by Michael Green Architecture. Um, probably familiar with this project, the Carbon Leadership Forum, which you'll see, did a did a, did a study of it on, on its own out of the University of Washington. Um, I think a remarkable project in in a few ways. The terracotta facade here on the left, how how it was assembled, um, the different types of, of facade here. So you've got three different. Um, uh, three different wall types within it. This is kind of breaking down the differences in between them. Um, and it was interesting too, is that we kind of assumed Katera did the project, but no, you know, most of the wood of the project or a lot of the wood of the project was actually sourced by other, other suppliers, other manufacturers, even in the make. So structural lamb and Western Arc uh, specifically there. Katera really only putting together some of the CLT by volume. And uh, this is where things kind of get interesting. So you can see you know why the, the volume is 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 different, but then the emissions and the storage per per player is different. So it began to ask the student really like, why is there such big differences in how we think about emissions or even biogenic storage? Um, and and why is my assessment? I you know I arrived at 357 kilograms uh, per per square meter. That's 1.72 times that of the LCA performed by the Carbon Leadership Forum itself at the University of Washington. Did I screw up? What's wrong? Uh, kind of a, a crisis moment for the student. I said, well, I, I, I trust your numbers. So dig into it, get that study, go look at it. And so, you know, here is the numbers uh, from the CLF study that was done, uh, you know, a little while ago and that it's down to that 207 number. And, and why is that? And this is why it is. So of the 52 materials considered in the CLF uh, study, 15 used, only 15 used manufacturer EPD data most of it was generic EPDs. And back to this, this is why. So that, that generic in the, in the CLF study here, you can see um, much, much lower than the actual, which the Western Arcrib Edmonton plant and the structural lemon in Penticton, that's a big difference per cubic meter here uh, from the manufacturers and from the generic in that CLF study, which we're not totally sure where that's based on, but back to that point of why generic is a problem. Um, and why we need to get so specific. And just to summarize on, on the, the mass timber part, you know, it's not without its own questions and problems. So when a tree is cut down, you know, uh, how do we quantify the impact? How do we think about, you know, forestry over time? Is it, is it, you know, this attributional approach or a consequential approach? You know, we can't just think that we've cut the wood, it's in a building that's sequestered. No, that building's already, that, that carbon's already been sequestered 
you're making space for new growth. And it's really understand the nature of the forestry that we're engaging. I think, you know, when we dug deeper, I've asked students to really get into forestry across Europe, Canada, um, the United States, how does it currently operate? I mean, this is, this is forestry in Alberta right now, one of the, one of the sources. And it's troubling when you look at that red line dipping below the blue line, that's a problem. That's every year they're taking more than they're planting, right? Um, and, and it kind of brings me back to this main question. So how can we have the embodied carbon of construction in Canada this decade, if this is how we're currently working? Um, I, I like to say like, here, here we are in a graph of, of emissions per person, you know, only, you know, slightly better than our friends to the South the United States. And, and just, you know, the only people we trail behind are Saudi Arabia and, and the Emirates states here. So I'd say of the G20 nations, we are the worst. We have the highest uh, footprint per person. And thus, I think as, as, uh, as people, as Canadians, we have the most responsibility um, globally to address our consumption here. Um, I think I want to kind of end on, on how we're going to get there, which is, I think for this crowd, the embodied carbon crowd, like how do we go from a business as usual to a radical radically better um, built footprint if we need to build, how do we reduce it? Uh, operationally, as we've seen through some of the projects, how do we get move towards passive systems or off grid to thus reduce our operational emissions? How do we design for reuse and not just sending things to landfill? How do we make sure that those C series emissions are actually something that we, that we account for at the beginning and are not going to go out? And I think a kind of big question and why it's important to understand Forestry specifically is, you know, what are the insetting and offsetting opportunities in a project, on a site, uh, in a wider uh, scheme to, to find, you know, ways to, to get uh, emissions on our side and not just some sort of um, abstract offset. And finally, you know, to help kind of push this work forward, I'm, you know, happy to, excited about launching a, a consultancy specifically around it on the back of this, this work with the city. So, you know, feel free to email me if you've got any questions um, around it. I will stop it there. That was awesome. Thanks so much, Kelly. Oh my gosh, so much information. I think everybody's probably just like, wow, that was fascinating. And it's nice to see a presentation that has so much rich data. I think there's a lot of kind of just, you know, qualitative information out there. And this was tons of quantitative kind of the meat and potatoes information that we all are looking for. So thank you so much for sharing that with us. Um, and uh, yeah, we've got a few questions. I don't know if Susan, if you want to just unmute yourself to ask, um, or I can read them out. No, I, I was just keeping it busy there, but my gosh, I'm so sorry that I'm the only person who seemed to ask questions. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, but one question I would like to ask, forget the rest, it's, um, it's about the wood. Uh, I actually used to work in pulp and paper years ago, um, and I used to build medium density fiberboard plants, Yeah. and I am really puzzled why we don't make low density fiberboard. Do you have, you, you have any thoughts on that, Kelly, or anyone else? Yeah, I, 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 uh, I edited this up. The student that looked at the, the spray foam I asked him the kind of next assignment was the history of insulation or history of different, the use of the history of the use of materials. And he looked at insulation and what was like really fascinating to me is like only until the thirties and forties did uh, we like the predominant insulation in Canada was wood fiber board and wool and, uh, and hemp. And, and like these things that we think are cutting edge now were the norm. Right. And I, 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 I'm not totally sure. I'm not a. I'm not an economic historian, but I think that has a lot to do with the materials that are now pervasive in our insulation and the kind of lobbying and advocacy and money that's associated to the fact that 11 materials out of 77 are made up of oil are in the our own CMHC's handbook. Like it doesn't take much stretch of imagination to think about why we are where we are. Right? We used to build this way. They've been phased out over time and they've been replaced with cheap petrochemicals. You could say this for so many different things, not just the building industry, right? Right. Um, right. I, think, I think the opportunity here is I, I, I insulated my own house with wood fiber board. I had to buy it from, you know, Bavaria and I live in the UK and like it's, you know, it's, there's only one supplier that does it. Yeah. Why we don't have it in Canada, 
it's, we're somebody's just gonna it's we'll have it soon and we just need to specify apparently there's it. someone in maine who's working on it the go go home uh go yeah. logic is working on developing it we'll see um, but also just, the petroleum companies as well as we um reduce our fossil fuel um you know we're going to be calling for with our vehicles and transportation and heating etc they're looking for alternative ways to push their product and so there's going to be this push going on also same time but hey really wonderful thank you so much for that presentation i'm going to thank you well i, I just say go. susan like specify that wood fiber board anywhere you can because we need to specify it to create the marketplace it's like a very much a chicken egg situation right and like somebody who's like oh, i can start a factory in maine but if everybody was like we're all going to be buying wood fiber board, the market will fill itself. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you. Are there uh, any other questions? Oh, I see Ryan put one in the chat. Ryan, if you want, you can unmute yourself um, or I can read it out. What would be considered one of the best insulations for carbon? Uh, mineral wool, wood fiberboard, et cetera. Is wood fiberboard feasible for taller slash part three buildings in terms of fire issues? Good question. Um, I, I'm, not, I'm not a fire expert. Uh, I think, again, it depends where it's put in an assembly. Um, I think Grenfell Tower has identified that even what we thought was fire compliant isn't necessarily uh, good for it. So. Yeah, I, somebody who can speak more of this, Carol, please, you could feel that. But I think certainly it it input in the right application, just like any material is, you know, it's performing a thermal, it's doing its job thermally, and it's up for us to put it in the right place to succeed. Yeah, um, thanks, Kelly. I just actually put something in the chat because I do think yeah. that the codes and regulations would also have to be impacted because of, you know, combustible insulation is a big regulatory issue. But yeah. um, but yeah, I, I think that there was work that was being done um, with Douglas Cardinal when he was doing that study for, um, for prefabricated houses for the North, where they were running into problems in having an assembly that had um, wood fiber insulation in it. Why? Again, because of regulatory issues, and then yeah. it becomes this sort of race where like a smaller design builder that he was working with, uh, you know, how much how much time tolerance do they have to wait it out kind of thing, right? Um, but I, I don't know enough about it, but it was just more, uh, it was just more something that came up in conversation. Yeah. But yeah, very interesting product. I, I hope it, I hope we find a way to include it in our building. Um, I see Patrick wants to ask a question verbally, and then there's a long one before that. I don't know, Emily, if you want to yeah. be the moderator here or how to best sure. do this. Yeah, yeah, no, Patrick, go ahead. All right, perfect. So just relative to the wood fiber insulation piece, um, you know, really, it, it is complex on the manufacturing side. I know a couple sawmills that have looked into this, and there are like a lot of different adhesives and such uh, that really are only European certified. They have to go through our Canadian code approval process and the Canadian Construction Materials Association. It's very costly. And so it's almost like starting over again with mass timber in a way. And we know um, how challenging that has been kind of getting, getting that, uh, I guess, comfort with, uh, with a lot of the authorities having jurisdiction. But um, Kelly, excellent presentation. One of, uh, one of my greatest questions relative to all of this kind of specific specific to like material specification. So let's just say mass timber versus conventional. Um, what, what do you recommend as what needs to happen for people to actually use this information in the right way? Like we know where it's living right now, it's a conversation, it's not financial incentive in any way at the moment. Even our building accreditation programs don't even really look at embodied carbon versus operational energy. So where, where do we need to go next here? And kind of perhaps what are you seeing from a European perspective that we could learn from? Yeah, uh, thanks, Patrick. I mean, the I, 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 live in, I live in London and my project is in, in Cambridge in the, the UK, which is like the, I don't know, the heartbeat of this conversation in many ways, like the planning authority and our design review panels is asking me about embodied carbon all the time. 
Um, and because it's been part of the conversation there, and, and now it's going to be, uh, there are benchmarks that you'd need to adhere to, um, to in, 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 that, in that jurisdiction to get your, your project through planning. Uh, REBA, uh, the Institute of British Architects, you can't even apply for awards anymore without submitting this information. So I think we're beginning to see the first step of like people doing the math, being part of the conversation, benchmarks and maximums happening. Um, it happens, it needs to happen. You know, the, the first thing is that we all know what it is and we can talk about it. It's, it's a very young conversation clearly. Um, and, but I, I'm, I fundamentally agree if we can, if we can advocate, I mean, I've been encouraged so far that the response from the city and the advisory panel that we put together of which a few people are, are on this this evening, if we can, I firmly believe if we can put conservative, you know, immediately easable, easy to reach benchmarks, and we ratchet that down over the next 10, 15, 20 years in the same way that the, the Letty framework in London has done. If you're familiar with Letty, I would totally look at it. It's like, these are easy to achieve today. We're going to make 10, 10% reductions every year. It's a clear telegraph guide for designers, engineers, uh, the, the, the supply industry, like, again, everybody's, you know, if everybody's like, how are we going to do this? Well, we're all going to figure it out. And we've got 10 years to figure it out. And it's going to create, I think it's going to that, that kind of top down mandating maximum benchmarks will create the innovation that we all need to see across like everything we do, um, towards, you know, towards, I think this being just common parlance. And, and that whole life view too, I think like we've been looking at energy efficiency for the last 30 years. And, and it's through that kind of myopic view that we've been using so much XPS, for example, because we've been using XPS because it's cheap and has a high R value, but we haven't even thought about what it's been doing emissions wise. It's like, it's the, it's the obvious example of what a, a single vantage. And so that's why I think we really need to look at, you know, whole life carbon for all projects and, and bring everyone along because I can't, the, the, the fear here is you're just gonna set a benchmark and get people out of business. We can't do this. This is actually, you know, not to sound like Joe Biden, this is an opportunity too, right? Like if, if could Toronto, you know, if Canada could really innovate in the space, the city that brought you unitized, you know, uh, window wall and fly form concrete, what's next, right? Um, uh, I think like this is really, you know, if we, can, if we could get around it as a profession, we could be we could be doing this everywhere as is the same way that we export a lot of our technology already. Uh, thanks, Kelly. There's a question here from Kat, um, and Kat, feel free to unmute if you want to ask your question. Um, so, if the use of wood can cut off the carbon footprint, won't its excessive use be destructive for landscapes and forests eventually? What is the probability that humans grow as much wood as they consume? How can it be controlled? Won't it eventually be as with any other non-renewable resource we used for construction before? Thank you and amazing presentation. Uh, um, well, um, since we've been on earth, we've been consuming more wood than we could grow. So I think the, uh, I, 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 that, that question is a kind of like, if we the, clearly there's not enough wood in the whole world for us to switch to mass timber overnight. And I, I'm certainly not advocating for that. I think um, we need to use it in a sustainable way. I think even the forestry sector, you know, talking to say just within Ontario, Forest Ontario is, an, is, a, is a resource that we're barely using, right? Like if, if you really understood the province of Ontario's current, um, current growth rate and how little of it's actually going into the, even the construction center, like we are scratching the surface of what's po possible. I think sustainably harvested woods uh, and, and, and buildings that use them very efficiently is a big part of the solution. We're going to continue to build new buildings in Canada and certainly in Toronto to meet the demands. Do we need to build as much or as big of the buildings we're doing right now? No, hell, certainly not. We need to be building smaller and more efficiently, making use of what we already have. This, this whole question is also part of how we're going to retrofit and reuse what we have you know, you know, employing these materials in intelligent ways. So um, I, I don't think we're going to consume our way out of this problem. I guess that's kind of in behind your question here. We need to be consuming far less of everything. 
and of what we consume, I think we need to be getting the stuff that's as, as you know, as, as, as low as possible from an emissions perspective. And, and wood is certainly a part of that uh, mix. Well said, for sure. I think the key being, yeah, we need to use less of everything and yeah. really rethink when we are building anything new, do we need to build new? Is there something existing that we can use instead? And then can we salvage existing materials? Like we just reduce, it should be like refuse, then reduce and reduce as much as possible before yeah. everything else, you know? So I completely agree. Um, does anybody have any other questions? I know we've gone a little bit over time, but it's such a great conversation. So I don't want to cut it off. If there's more uh, questions out there. Uh, one from Ronnie. Are the older construction materials being hemp, wood fiber, stone, brick, et cetera, appropriate for mid-rise buildings? What are the implications for insulation? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I, I guess my, my follow-up question, Ronnie, would be what do you mean by mid-rise? If you could like define mid-rise. If you can type it in there or something, I don't know. But um, within how, say, the city of Toronto defines mid-rise, um, my kind of flippant response, like seven to 10 floors, the Royal York Hotel is built out of stone and brook and wood and all this stuff, right? So is Union Station. So is every building built, you know, in Toronto, say before 1920, it was built with this stuff. And I think the one, one thing I keep thinking about is, what do we build our buildings out of 100 years ago? That's a great place to look for clues um, because it was material that wasn't coming from a great distance and it was not exhaustively refined. Um, it's it's where we could look for clues, like the Royal, like the like yeah, you know, like the Royal Oak Hotel. It's got a stone foundation as well. That's a great example. Uh, any other questions for anybody? If not, we can leave it there. Um, so the presentation has been recorded and uh, we will be, I believe, putting it up on the CLF Toronto website or sending out a, a link uh, to everybody. Um, but yeah, thank you so much everybody for joining. Again, I'm sorry that we couldn't meet in person. Um, but I'm glad that we got so many folks to join tonight. I think this is really fantastic. Um, a great start to 2022. Very inspirational. So thanks so much, Kelly. We really, really appreciate you taking the time to speak with all of us. Right on. Thanks, Emily, for the invitation. And, and yeah, please reach out. For sure. Happy New Year, everybody. Take care. Thank you. Good night.